welcome to Linux Action News, our weekly take on Linux and the open source world. This is episode 17, recorded on September 3rd, 2017. I'm Chris. And I'm Joe. Hello, Joe. You know, often the saying goes, where there's smoke, there's fire. And apparently there's a little bit of fire in New York because an Ubuntu rally is in the works, taking place in New York City September 25th through the 29th. And it looks like it could be quite the festival. Yeah, I had heard about this on the grapevine, but now it's all official. It's basically an excuse to get people together to work on Snaps and Gnome by the looks of things. And they're inviting all sorts of people and rumor has it paying for all sorts of people to go there and take part in this. Very much like the last one that they had in London about a year ago, was it? Yeah, they seem to be tar- targeting application developers, uh, IoT device manufacturers, and PC OEMs who want to help set future direction goals in Ubuntu or enable Ubuntu on their hardware. And also then a, a call out to active and passionate community members as well. I take this as sort of the beginnings of a, a kind of a big canonical event. And it's really downtown in New York City. I think it's like at one of the Hyatt hotels there. There's information in the show notes and also on the Ubuntu Insights blog. Are you going to make it, Joe? No, unfortunately. But my friend Ike is, by the looks of things. Yeah, yeah. Quite a few folks that we mention often on this show are going to be there. And I'm going to try to make it myself. I don't know how. I'm doing all the travel math right now. And you and I, of course, are going to have to figure out recording math. But uh, I'm going to try to make it. I'm going to try to get there. And I think this is going to be a big event. There is a lot of momentum in different directions around Ubuntu 1710. Big changes around Canonical. And with Mark Shuttleworth sort of taking the reins again, and he's going to be really rallying this event, this Ubuntu rally. I I want to see that. I want to come back and I want to report on it for the show. So I think I'm going to try to make it. Oh, that'd be awesome if you could get there. It's a long way away, though, isn't it? It's a a continent away. And the timing and budget is not so lining up at the moment. That's sort of a nice way to say it. So I, I may end up just loading up in my truck and sleeping in my truck and just driving there and grinding it out and then just figuring out where I'm going to stay and how I'm going to make that work when I get there. Uh, You probably know enough people across the US to kind of stay on some couches or something. Maybe. This is the first time I'm saying anything publicly about it. So if anybody's going to be around the area of this event, maybe hit me up on Twitter or Telegram (laughs) at Chris Elias and let me know if you've got a couch available for me and my lady because, yeah, we're going to pile in there and head out. And I'm going to put feelers out there for other folks within JB and see if they want to go. But right now, uh, it's just the early stages of sort of a crazy plan. Because I think it's going to be worth going. Yeah, definitely. So 17.10, speaking of Ubuntu, the beta 1 has come out, but not of the the main flavor of Ubuntu, because they don't participate in beta 1. So it's a lot of the flavors, Ubuntu Mate, Zubuntu, Ubuntu Chillin, uh, Lubuntu, Ubuntu Studio, so it's our first glance. When I first heard about it, I was uh, quite excited because I thought it was going to be a milestone for the main version, but it looks like we're going to have to wait a little while for beta 2. But looking at some of these flavors, specifically, the most interesting to me is actually Ubuntu Chillin, which is spelt Kylin, but it's pronounced Chillin. And that looks like Windows. They've basically taken Mate and made it look like Windows. And this is for the Chinese market. So it's not a huge surprise, is it, that Uh, they wanted to make it look like Windows. Indeed. Uh, Looking at this 1710 release, when you consider Ubuntu Chillin and the work that the Ubuntu Mate project has been doing, that flavor, with their new heads-up display, the improved super key support that really nails it now, global menu improvements, and really getting a pretty pretty spot-on implementation of Unity called Mutiny, this is all going to draw more and more attention to this project. I think Ubuntu 1710, the Chillin and Ubuntu Mate flavors, are representing sort of a milestone for the Mate project. A milestone that is is easy to miss, but if you think about it, really indicates that this traditional desktop paradigm has gotten traction. And there's people using it. And it is actually possible to take this traditional desktop paradigm and move it into modern computing. And both these projects are bearing that out. 
Yeah, not to mention Plasma 5 that's been trucking along with the traditional desktop for years now. Indeed, indeed, indeed. In fact, speaking of the Plasma 5 release, uh, Kubuntu 17.10 will have KDE Plasma 5.10 and will use Xorg by default. Uh, Some of these flavors will be using Wayland. This is an interesting division throughout Ubuntu now. You'll have Ubuntu proper 17.10 using Wayland by default, but some flavors, like Kubuntu, will be using Xorg. Yeah, and... The XFCE version, Ubuntu, which is what I use, that's just looks exactly the same. That's, <laughs> it's funny. Just that's how you like, like it, though. right, Joe? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why, why change for its own sake, you know? <laughs> yeah, why change at all? Of course, Reddit's making big changes, and the headline change for our audience is not so much more with the open source. I mean, individual components, but, you know, sort of that big core component, not so much. Yeah, which is a shame, but... The reality is that it hasn't been properly open source for a long time. They've been very bad with the commits and and keeping it all up to date on GitHub. And so really, they're just formalizing their position, saying that they basically can't be open source for, for numerous reasons, which are a little bit spurious, really, I think. Yeah, I agree. They say that it makes it hard for them to develop some features in the clear, like the recent video launch. Well, that's, you know, that doesn't mean that you can't do that Google style and throw it over the wall when it's finished. Yeah, exactly. And they say, look, you know, we're big now. People know about Reddit. We're a player on the web. So it's hard for us to be strategic in our planning when everyone can see the code we're committing. That's got to be some weak of the weakest sauce right there. There are so many ways around that, and that's their number one feature. Now, here's a part I do understand, and this is their second bullet point. Because of the above, our internal development production and feature branches have been moving further and further from canonical state of the open source repository. Such balkanization means that merges are getting increasingly difficult, especially as the company grows and more developers are touching the code more frequently. That That is a legitimate point there, especially if you are trying to be less and less open source. Well, yeah. It, and it's funny that they say they basically only open sourced it in the first place because they knew they were a small company and they could go bust or whatever and they wanted to have it out there for the community should the community need to step up and take it off them. But now they're basically saying, oh, we're safe now. We've got our business model. We've been around long enough. We don't need to be open source. And it's it's really disappointing. What do you think about this argument? Because I could see this coming up more and more. This could be a way of the future here. They write, as we move towards a more service-oriented architecture, Reddit is being divided into many smaller repositories that are under active development. So it's sort of this, we're rebuilding Reddit in individual components, and as we do that, um, we're not really rewriting them as open source components. But uh, why not? Why not just make them open source? It just seems like a lot of very spurious arguments here. I could see uh, these last two arguments being used by other open source projects that want to go closed source. Now, they point out that they still believe, these are the terminologies they actually use, we believe in open source, and we want to make sure that our contributions are both useful and meaningful. So we'll continue to open source tools that are of use to engineers everywhere. And they include a couple of examples. It's funny that turn of phrase, isn't it? They believe in open source. Yeah, they literally believe it exists. Well, that doesn't really help if your code's proprietary, does it? (laughs) I believe in gravity, Joe. I'm a strong believer in gravity. Yeah, well, Reddit's just toxic anyway, isn't it? That is true. You know, really, perhaps it's time for something new to come along because it's overall, it's a dumpster fire. And what we really need, perhaps, is a petition, a change.org petition for the people. Yeah, because petitions always succeed in their goals, don't they? Yeah. Mm. Well, this one actually did. A petition that was started by a community member of Phoenix OS, which we've talked about in the past on this show, launched a change.org petition to open source the kernel of Phoenix OS. But in this circumstance, it actually made a difference. Yeah, so they were violating the GPL before, and now they've released what looks like it's probably all of the source code, but we're not 100% sure, are we? 
Yeah, they're still trying to verify it. So it seems like there's been an effort for the last couple of days. I went all in on this, Joe. I read facts. I got involved in the Discord comments and community. I spoke to one of the developers. And there was this weird two-day period where they attempted to verify the source code. I'm not sure why it took so long, but somebody came along and offered their services and did at least verify that there are deviations from upstream Android kernel source. Okay, so it's probably the kernel from Phoenix OS then. Yeah. It sounds like there's more work to be done, um, including making it possible for the community to interact and all of this. So there's still more work to be done. The, the change.org petition has been updated now to reflect the things that are still outstanding. Yeah. And Phoenix OS is kind of the last man standing, isn't it, in terms of uh, desktop Android? That's why this matters. Um, and it is actually, as far as open source and Android is concerned, a fairly important story. And there's more to be done with Phoenix OS, including a ton of work on graphics cards and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So there's there's a ton of area here where the open source community could really contribute and make this thing more viable. Yeah, and I'd like to see it more international because it's it feels very Eastern at the moment. It's very kind of Chinese focused with the apps that you've got pre-installed and stuff in it. It just doesn't feel like it's for me as a Westerner. Yeah, I, I could see maybe bringing in a, the open source community as a way of resolving that as well. Mm. But back to regular Android handsets, those of us that will just be using stock Android may have a bit of a better time. We've been stuck with old versions of kernels. Google has never really cared what version of the kernel an OEM uses as long as everything works. Yeah, but now they're going to mandate... 4.4 or later, which is quite a big jump because even my OnePlus 3T running the latest lineage 14.1, which is based on Android 7.1. So it's not, I suppose it's not quite the latest, but that is running a 3.18 kernel, mm. which is, that's ancient. Yeah. Well, starting now, Google is going to require if you use Oreo, that your system on a chip has to support a 4.4 kernel or newer, and you have to ship that. And the really slick thing about that is, and this is going to have long-term actual ramifications here as people start to roll this out, Project Treble is built into this version of Android, which means it's going to be easier to upgrade that kernel down the road. So this is a major news story for Android. Once we get people on this baseline version of Android and on this baseline kernel 4.4 or newer, we will be starting a path towards an x86-style ability to update your kernel on your phone whenever there's an update coming out. And that's going to be a game-changer for Android. I don't know if it's quite that uh, level of x86, but it's certainly a damn sight better than it is at the moment. You're right. I shouldn't overstate it because it's going to be a multi-year process to get there because just getting handsets on a kernel 4.4 is going to take years. Then there's going to be a transition period where... OEMs start to wake up to the reality that they can now swap out individual layers of Android without having to worry about breaking their driver support. Once that clicks in and they've updated their development process, then Android handsets will start to benefit. But that's years, Joe. Well, they needed to do this, didn't they, Google? The, the whole update thing we've been talking about for years, it's just broken, fundamentally broken, the way updates work on Android. The fact that you've got people running version 4 and stuff it's it's just absolutely ridiculous whereas if you look at the other side of the fence with apple even sort of 6 7 year old iPhones are running maybe one or two versions behind at most so it needed to happen and it's good to see that google have finally made the changes that they need to make and it's going to take a while but at least we'll get there linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Go there to support the show, but also sign up for a free seven-day trial of a platform designed to teach you everything about Linux with self-paced in-depth video courses, hands-on scenario-based labs, full-time human instructors that are happy to help when you need them. And one of the things that I'm really appreciative of Linux Academy, you choose your Linux distribution, that adjusts the courseware and the virtual machines that they spin up on demand. They all match. So Debian or Red Hat, whatever is perfect for your work environment. That's genius. That's something that only a platform built by Linux enthusiasts would do. They have practice exams that prepare you for certs. They also have courseware that's really designed to focus on certifications if that's your current goal. Or if you want to move into a new career track, they have learning paths for that as well. linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Go there to support this show and sign up for a free trial for seven days. linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. 
Okay, let's talk about the essential phone. So Andy Rubin, the father of Android, announced this a few months ago, and there was a lot of hype about it. And it has failed to deliver so far on many different levels. And the first is that he promised it would ship within 30 days, and this was at the end of May. So that means by the end of June. And here we are in September, and it's only just about starting to ship now. And then they made promises that it would be within a week, and it just they keep letting us down, which is kind of understandable for a startup. And, you know, I'm not going to be too harsh on them for that. But then this week, they just royally screwed up. Mm -hmm. They managed to somehow send everyone's information <laughs> to everyone. What appears to have happened is that Essential had a list of customers it needed to verify to prevent fraud for orders. So it sent them an email requesting more information. But that email address was set up as a group email, which meant that replies sent to it were then sent to everybody on the mailing list. It was a misconfigured customer support address on their Zendesk system, <laughs> which, which is a customer service portal. And, you know, it's one of those things that when you're a new company and you've never used it in production, these things happen. And it's really embarrassing. Yeah, that is really embarrassing. I mean, where do you stand on them failing to deliver the actual phones, though? Delays in shipping are understandable. This one may be fatal. This delay has pushed them right up against the new launch of the Note 8 and the iPhone 8. Massive competition. And this could be a real death blow to the essential phone. And then you combine it with the early reviews that are not looking particularly positive, particularly around this camera that's been promoted extensively. Ooh, it turns out, Joe, phones are hard. Yeah, it's funny that. If only we knew of some other companies that had tried to make phones and push them into the market and disrupt it and failed completely. Hmm. The difference here is that he came up with Android in the first place, so you'd think that he would know a bit about it, but... Apparently not. I mean, I recall being a bit skeptical at the time and saying there's no way I'd pay that much for a phone. And it seems that they've just overhyped, they've overpromised and underdelivered. You've got a situation where it's a first generation phone. Maybe they should have been a bit more, um, more like OnePlus were about it. Their first hmm. one was all yeah. word of mouth and the, the, maybe not the invitation system and stuff. That was kind of a bit dumb. But be low key about it first. Make sure you get one product out the door that's working. And we haven't even talked about this 360-degree camera that was touted as one of the great things about it. This phone's modular. You can clip on these accessories. Well, that camera is nowhere in sight. My takeaway from all of this, and it's something that I hope that open source projects can watch and learn from so they don't make the same mistake, is the talent and the engineering is a component. But shipping a phone requires many components, and it requires a well-oiled machine underneath it. And a lot of what's happening here is marketing promises that don't live up to the hype, like the promises about camera or battery life that aren't living up to the hype, or the yeah. shipping dates. You know, Andy doesn't have direct control over manufacturing deadlines and shipping dates. So it's not just good engineering talent. It's also a really well-oiled machine that supports shipping a consumer product like this. Yeah, and first generation, you're going to make mistakes. So they really shouldn't have hyped it as much as they did. But what are you going to do? They did. Speaking of hype, blockchains have all of it these days, and there is big money in the blockchain business. Well, there's big money in cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, for example, Ethereum, that sort of thing. But there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. You think blockchain, you think Bitcoin. But the reality is that big business has been watching this develop and actively taking part in the development of blockchain technology and has been implementing it in lots of different ways that have nothing to do with Bitcoin. Indeed, like initial coin offerings, ICOs, which are essentially investment coins that people are investing in different technologies. There's venture capital firms like Sequoia and Anderson Horowitz that are getting into this. But you know what's really funny, Joe, is at the, at the core of all of this blockchain hype, is the most boring thing ever. And I'm sorry to our accountants in the audience, but underneath <laughs> all of this, it's just a re-innovation of accounting. It's an improvement in a major way to, to accounting. And that's, that's the big story here. And they're all just trying to figure it out. Yeah, and not necessarily just financial accounting, but actual accounting of stock and where it's moving to and uh, which distribution networks it's going through and at what stage it is and everything. It's just documentation of 
all of the boring bits of a business. Yeah, a, a blockchain is a kind of a ledger, a table that businesses could use to track credits and debts, but also all the things that Joe just mentioned. And it's not like a standard SQL database. It's it's something that's cryptographically verified. One of the blockchain's distinguishing features is that chains are verified transactions in a sequence of blocks. And this it, you can't go back once a block is committed. So it's it's in, it's a public ledger, it's been cryptographically verified, it uses complex, verifiable math, so everybody can have faith in the system. And when properly applied, a blockchain can help assure data integrity, maintain audible records, and perhaps in some different iterations, render financial contracts into a programmable software. In a contract is confirmed, it's read on the blockchain, action is immediately taken. So that when you have something that businesses can share amongst themselves that is cryptographically verified, it opens up a huge range of business automation and potentials, and that's what everybody's rushing towards right now. You said one key word there, public, which we're used to with Bitcoin and stuff, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a public ledger. It can be an internal to sure. the company ledger. Yeah. And I, I guess, think that's, yeah. that's one of the key strengths here, that you can have uh, something that is, as you say, cryptographically verified, so you can know within your company that it hasn't been tampered with, it's exactly what it should be. And it's a, a permanent record of pretty much anything you want it to be. And so it's no wonder that these companies are taking advantage of it because it makes far more sense than traditional databases. And that's why you're seeing all kinds of companies jump in and the Linux Foundation, which is really trying to legitimize business around the blockchain. Yeah, hopefully the Linux Foundation's involvement will make sure it all stays open source and that we can all benefit from it. But let's end with some positive news, shall we? And that is that Linux browser market share is above 3% now. 3.37% according to Net Applications. So we should all have a party for 3.37%. That's actually pretty cool, 3.37%. So you might wonder, like, where do these stats come from and why do you seem to hear about them from time to time? Uh, Net Applications is a business that resells and white labels their data that they collect and they publish it free once a month. And this kind of creates a news story about once a month. We've never really covered it because, well, it's never been above 3%. Now, where does the data come from? They claim they have 40,000 websites that participate. They take that data. They only count one visit per day. Even if you visited, say, a site a dozen times, they only count you once. And then they average all out and they get, they get their math. It's interesting sounding, but when I dug into it, I, I tried to sign up. I wanted to pretend like I wanted to participate in the program. And when I sniffed around, it looked like they actually have more like 19,000 active participating sites. The number 40,000 participating websites hasn't changed since 2008. So I'm a little suspicious of that. And Apple and Microsoft are clients of theirs. And they've admitted that in the past. So there could be some bias. But either way, even if it's not a huge selection, at best, at absolute best, it's 160 million uniques. That's if you believe their 40,000 number. But surely you can extrapolate that to some extent. I agree. And so do they. In fact, they use data provided by the CIA. <laughs> I'm not making this up <laughs> to uh, consider like a uh, trend information about different areas around the world to take that into consideration. Historically, they've been really underrepresenting Asia. And uh, I guess with this new data by, <laughs> provided by the CIA, they're now able to take more of a general accounting. And so it does seem to be representative of the web. Uh, but I actually think it's low. I think it's a low number. And one of the challenges that they've had recently is Chrome OS and uh, mobile. And I think Linux is actually getting significantly underrepresented. But I'll take 3.3%. That's pretty respectable. But I think it's actually low, amazingly. Well, I think we need to define this. You say Linux. So Chrome OS has a Linux kernel and Android has a Linux kernel. Do you specifically mean GNU slash desktop Linux? I do because they do separate it out. Uh, Chrome OS has 0.56%. Uh, according to another site, which is Stat Counter, and uh, they also represent uh, Chrome OS in uh, Net Applications market share data. I do, I do think Linux is underrepresented in this data simply because some of the sites that they have in their participation program, I don't think really cater to a technical audience. They're more average consumer gossipy entertainment websites and like e entertainment and those types of gossip magazines, and less things like Stack Exchange 
Google Groups, Hacker News, those types of sites. Surely it would make more sense if they could get Google, <laughs> google.com. That would be a handy uh, general purpose website or Amazon or something like that, that everybody uses. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the real answer just has to lie in our hearts, Joe. <laughs> well, 2017 is the year of Linux on the desktop for me, as have the last 10. So <laughs> that's all that matters to me. That's right. Hashtag personal year of the Linux desktop. If you want to hear more about Linux itself, check out linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the different ways to get new episodes of our show every single Monday. Yeah, and go to linuxactionnews.com slash contact for all the ways you can get in touch with us. You can support the network at patreon.com slash Signal to keep great independent coverage like our humble show on the air. Yeah, and we'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. I'm at Chris LAS. I'm at Joe Rissington. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week. See you later.